blessing of the Lord be upon you, my brother Seraphim, Abbot of New Monastery, and we are continuing our series of Bible studies with the blessing of His Grace, our Bishop Longin. We were in the book of Genesis and ended with the end of chapter 6. We are going to continue with chapter 7. With chapter 6, um, in the chapter it was stated that people had multiplied on the earth, but they were quite evil, wicked, sin had abounded everywhere, and it repented God that he even made man. That is a horrific statement, but that's how bad things were. And then God found one man that was righteous and obedient, willing to do his will, and that was Noah. So God decided, since he had repented that he even made man altogether, to kill off all living things on the earth, man and beast, which usually implies mammals, and the fowl of the air, and the creeping things, the birds, reptilians, etc. So the Lord tells Noah how to build the ark that is going to survive the flood that is coming. And Noah builds it exactly to those specifications. It's a detailed description of how the ark was supposed to be built. And then, at one point, the Lord tells Noah to board the ark with all the animals and with his family. He and his wife and his sons, three sons and their wives. And important to note, of all the animals, it says here, the Lord told Noah to take seven each of the clean animals and two each of the unclean. We'll see later why that will be important. So then the flood started. The sources of water from below opened up and the water came up and the heavens opened up and the water that was above the heavens, as it says in the book, also came down and after it had rained for a certain number of days, the water had gone up 15 cubits. That's how it says exactly. Cubit is a measure of length. That's an elbow, so maybe about two feet. But at some point, it says that everything was underwater, including the hills and the mountains. And Noah set off in the ark, floating around in the floodwaters. So in chapter 8, the floodwaters stop, and Noah is still out there in the ark, with his family and with all the animals that the Lord had told him to put into the ark to save their lives. And after the flood water started subsiding, the ark landed on the Mount of Ararat. Now, this is another thing where somebody who is willing to do research and likes to do research on such things, again, biblical archaeology, can look at uh, actual Mount Ararat in Armenia and find out a lot of interesting things, such as that the ark is there. It's under ice and snow, it's impossible to dig out, it will be damaged, etc., etc., problematic region. But if you do a simple search online for Armenia, Yerevan, excursions to Ararat, it's there. So <clears throat> This would be a challenge, right, for someone to figure out why is there a big boat sitting on top of a mountain under the ice and snow. So we are going to read uh, one part here that talks about how the flood ended little by little. Uh, Genesis chapter 8, verses 6 through 10. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro, until the waters were dried up from the earth. It doesn't say explicitly, but a raven never came back. The Holy Fathers will say raven was eating the carcasses and whatever was there after the flood. 
So he sent forth a dove from him, Noah did, to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. This is already after a couple of months of everything being flooded. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. <clears throat> if you ever noticed, saw anywhere, the symbol of peace, dove carrying an olive branch. This is the origin of that imagery. So we go on through chapter 8, and after the dove had come back, actually verse 12 he stayed yet other seven days and sent for the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. So the dove also found a nice place to land and stayed out of the ark. And then Noah knew it was time to open the ark door and let everybody and everything out of the ark. So, um, verse 20. This is an important detail that I want to bring out. After everybody leaves the ark, the Lord says again, like he did to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Important to reiterate that commandment again. And then, verse 20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. This also, among other things, puts things in perspective in certain times of uncertainty. If we feel that we are living in a time of uncertainty, well, here's the Lord saying, as long as the world turns, this is all going to be like this. Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night. A certain natural order stays in place after the flood that will not end as long as the world turns. So... <clears throat> Verse 20, Noah took of those clean beasts and fowl that he put into the ark, and he offered sacrifice. Let's try to keep uh, uh, our mind focused on this. In so many stories that we are going to read, we are going to keep seeing the concept of a sacrifice. Uh, Cain and Abel offered sacrifice, which... Um, it didn't end well for either because Cain killed Abel and was then cursed. Abel's sacrifice was accepted by the Lord, so the Lord took him, we could imagine. Um, now Noah comes out of the ark and he offers sacrifice. Chapter 9, we go on. We are going to read from verses 8 through 15. Also an important concept to keep in mind here. And God spoke unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy all the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. 
I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. What are the important concepts to take from this? Again, there will, be, uh, there will not be a flood anymore, ever again, that would drown and cover all the earth and kill all the living things on the earth. Obviously, there are local floods happening for different reasons, but not a global one, to put it that way. Then, the Lord establishes a covenant. This is a very important concept to keep in mind. The Lord is trying to make a covenant with people. Another word for a covenant will be testament. So, we'll see little by little how this makes more and more sense. At this point, the Lord says, It is a covenant that I will not drown and kill all the living things by a flood again. It's a promise. It is sealed by something, and, as the scripture says in another place, what greater thing can God himself swear by except by his own name? We'll see exactly how this plays out all the way into and to the end of the New Testament and the entire plan of our salvation, really. But covenant, testament, let's keep that concept in mind also. Also, for somebody who would like to um, maybe think about this, maybe do some research, hopefully not fall into a rabbit hole, if we know that a rainbow is formed by the light refracting through particles of water, and the Lord says, when I put a cloud over the earth, the bow will be visible in the cloud. How is it that before the flood, such a thing was not happening? It says something about the entire setup of planet Earth, about the atmosphere of planet Earth, about the entire natural order of things. And whoever would like to spend more time on it is welcome to spend more time on it. We are not going to go into that. We shall continue. Noah's, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, here's a brief story. We'll read chapter 9, verses 20 through 27. What happened with Noah and his three sons. Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Whether this sounds um, right and just, uh, in the context of today's outlook on the world, this idea in the ancient times, as we are going to see over and over again in the Old Testament, about one person receiving a blessing and the other one not receiving a blessing or even being cursed, is a very important one. It is not just taken lightly. Uh, Noah didn't just utter a bunch of words in the moment of anger, but from this point, 
when we see Shem, Hem, and Japheth, we see, little by little, the origin of the nations. So, we'll see later on how the descendants of Shem, which would be the blessed ones, the ones who would obey God's will, uh, moved into the land of Canaan. And later on again, a few generations after that, after being in Egypt, God's people, Israel, again comes back to the land of Canaan. And Canaan is always at a disadvantage and is always the servant of Shem, if not even worse than that. So at the end of chapter 9, we begin, uh, I, I, I mean, we end chapter 9 with the story of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Two were blessed, one was cursed. Um, we see the beginning of the concept of nations forming in that area in the Middle East as we know it today. Chapter 10 is again genealogy. Uh, this one is not uh, too burdensome to read through. We are not going to read through all of it, just mention a detail or two. Again, in the context of nations beginning to form, here in chapter 10, verse 8, it says, Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, or Babylon. If we study the history of the world, by any uh, <clears throat> measure of historic record, we see the origin of human civilization in Mesopotamia, between the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, which today is called Iraq, and up until not that long ago, that kingdom was called Babylon. So, <clears throat> we are going to come back to Babylon very quickly after this. The rest of chapter 10 has more and more uh, genealogies, who begat whom, and who moved in which direction, um, the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. If somebody likes to remember this much data about the names and the places, it certainly falls into context as we read the stories later. If uh, one does not remember all these names and places, we'll get to the point of the stories anyway. So, chapter 11. We are at the beginning of the human civilization. We are in Babylon. And the people have an idea that was not very pleasing to God. We are going to read verses 1 through 9. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city, and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad 
upon the face of all the earth. <clears throat> the concept of the Tower of Babylon never ceases to be a current one. These people came together and they built the tower not only for the purpose of soul preservation. They built a, the tower that would reach up to heaven. That was a very bold move. That was a very um, ungodly move. It was directed really against God. Because people tried to build themselves a city and a name. They wanted to be proud and glorious on the earth. And God said, basically, in a paraphrased way, we told them to scatter all over the world and not stay here and do something like this. And now this is what they do. So God confused their languages so they would scatter all over the earth and be fruitful and multiply and fill it. So in today's study, a couple of concepts that we can review and keep in mind, mainly, most importantly, we'll see out of this story of the Tower of Babel, nobody came blessed immediately. It took a while for generations of people to multiply again until God would encounter somebody that would be pleasing to him and willing to be obedient. That was Abram, who later would be called Abraham. So what do we have with Noah versus all these people that got drowned in the flood? Noah was obedient. He wasn't just a righteous man. If a person says, I'm simply going to be a righteous human being, uh, it is possible to remove God out of that equation. I'm going to be righteous for righteousness sake. But if Noah seeks to do God's will, then he is automatically pretty much guaranteed to be a righteous human being. And what he does is going to be blessed. Just like God did take him out of all the people's and did bless him, and he survived. And this whole world, if we take the Bible literally, as some of us do, of course, is <clears throat> populated thanks to Noah and his descendants. In these genealogies, there's interesting details that say that at a certain moment, from a certain person, the earth was divided. Probably doesn't refer to Pangaea getting divided. That would be too radical in too short of a time. But nations were divided, and languages. So, <clears throat> an obedient man will be blessed, will automatically be righteous, and will be chosen like Noah, and then like Shem and Japheth, and certain of their descendants, to do God's will. So that God's will for all of mankind can eventually be manifest to all the peoples of this world. He who chooses to be disobedient will inevitably end up in unrighteousness or wickedness, and what is going to befall them sooner or later, in one form or another, is death. Death is going to come upon all human beings living in this world, in this flesh that we have. What we are talking here about, of course, is the eternal death. So we are going to leave it here with the concept that Abram or Abraham will be introduced next time in chapter 12 and then everything that comes from him will follow. If you have any questions, uh, again, please feel free to ask your parish priests. They would love to talk about the scripture. If uh, you cannot for some reason Option two, option three, post them here, post them on Facebook where this video will appear and we will make sure to answer them as they come in and may God's blessing be with all of you. We will continue next time, tomorrow.